Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 86 Indoctrinated Part 2 War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. Picking up where we left off in Part 1, John Muhammad and Lee Malva were now back in the vicinity of the man's ex wife Millie and the Muhammad children. It was on October 2nd, 2002, that the first sniper shootings began to raise eyebrows. At 5.20 p.m., a single bullet was fired into the Michaels Arts and Crafts store in Aspen Hill, Maryland, but luckily no one was injured, just confused. It was less than an hour later and only a mile away in Wheaton, Maryland, that a shot rang out just after 6 p.m. outside a shopper's food warehouse grocery store. Carrying supplies and donations meant for elementary school students whom he and his colleagues mentored, 55-year-old Civil War enthusiast James Martin was fatally shot in the parking lot. He left behind an 11-year-old son. In order to efficiently carry out making such a shot undetected, a hole had been cut into the back of the Chevy Caprice, just above and to the side of the license plate. In preparation for a shooting, Lee Malvo was thought to climb through the rig back seat, lying down and inserting just enough of the tip of the rifle through the hole to wreak havoc on the general public. The following day, October 3rd, at 7.41 a.m., 39-year-old James L. Buchanan Jr., known as Sonny, was mysteriously injured while pushing a lawnmower around the Fitzgerald Auto Mall in the White Flint area of Rockville, Maryland. Now living in Virginia, running a Christmas tree farm and teaching kids about plants, Sonny returned to the car dealership to maintain the grass, just like he always had. When he stumbled over to some employees following an audible boom, those around him assumed that the mower he was pushing had somehow hurt him, even telling the 911 dispatcher as much. EMS workers soon determined that Sonny Buchanan had been shot. The doctors and local law enforcement were delving into how Buchanan had died, as 54-year-old cab driver Prem Kumar Walakar was putting gas into his car at a mobile station in Rockville, Maryland, at 8.12 a.m. He'd gotten an early start to his workday so he could call it quits early and enjoy the day which was proving to be a beautiful one. The native of India had successfully raised two children and helped bring his brothers and sisters to join them in the United States. Following a sudden and startling bang, the woman in the car behind him looked up to see him staggering toward her, requesting she dial 911. She was a doctor and began CPR after calling for an ambulance and flagging down a passing police officer. Their efforts would be fruitless against the damage done by the bullet that had seared its way through his lung and into his heart. The diversionary onslaught, thought up by John Muhammad and carried out by Lee Malvo, was in full swing. Just as authorities were getting that crime scene established, a new shooting was reported less than two miles away in Silver Spring, Maryland at 8.37 a.m., Sarah Ramos was quietly reading on a bus bench within the Leisure World shopping plaza, waiting for her employer to pick her up for work when she was struck and killed by a lone sniper's bullet, leading to immediate chaos and confusion. The bullet went through her head and into the restaurant behind her. 
It was at this scene that a witness reported to police hearing Poppy, then seeing a particular type of vehicle flee the scene. A white van or box truck was described as the suspicious model. Investigators took this lead seriously and put the word out for patrol officers and civilians alike to be on the lookout for this type of truck, a move which by all accounts seemed logical at the time, but would ultimately lead to accusations of tunnel vision in the investigation. Less than 90 minutes later, authorities would be setting up yet another sniper shooting investigation when just before 10 a.m., a shot rang out in Kensington, Maryland. 25-year-old nanny Lori Lewis Rivera was at a Shell gas station five miles from the scene of the last shooting, vacuuming out her minivan when she was fatally shot by someone unseen. Lori had moved to this community thinking it would be a better environment in which to raise her young child than her native Idaho. Given the proximity to the first anniversary of September 11th and a governmental alert sent out earlier in 2002, those in the area had a difficult time eliminating the notion that terrorists could be targeting the area around our nation's capital. Montgomery County, Maryland police noted that their homicide rate had just increased by 25% in a single day. Police quickly set up a 24-hour-a-day tip hotline, receiving more than 1,000 calls within the first day. Many of these calls were focused on the white box truck that the media had been pressing as a viable lead. Just when citizens in the area had begun to settle into a few hours' respite, 72-year-old retired carpenter Pascal Charlot became the only sniper victim in Washington, D.C. itself when he was shot under the cover of darkness as he crossed Georgia Avenue. Charlot was shot once in the chest and died soon after reaching the hospital. Two separate witnesses at the Washington, D.C. crime scene gave descriptions of a dark, square American car, and one of them specifically described it as a Chevy Caprice with heavily tinted windows. Although Washington, D.C. Police Chief Charles H. Ramsey said that officers were instructed to be looking out for such a car, when they do come across it later, it leads nowhere. John Muhammad and Lee Boyd Malvo weren't close to being done, and just 17 hours later, they struck again, this time in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. We were days into the D.C. area siege by now, and at 2 p.m. on October 4th, Multiple 911 calls came in reporting the shooting of 43-year-old Carolyn Sewell at a Michael's Craft store in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Police were hesitant on releasing her name at first as fears that she could still be a target swirled, when two days later, 13-year-old Iron Brown was targeted outside Benjamin Tasker Middle School in Bowie, Maryland. Multiple media outlets had just reported that no children had yet been targeted by the snipers when the shooting occurred. Clearly, they were watching the news and reading the newspapers. The teen usually attended a prayer service before school, however, on this day he had switched up his schedule, placing him at a location he wouldn't normally be. Iron's aunt was a nurse and had driven him to school that day. She witnessed her nephew get shot and had the presence of mind to get him back in the car and race him to the hospital. He went on to recover from his wounds, which included a damaged liver, lung, spleen, diaphragm, and pancreas. Police found a bullet casing, and upon search of the wooden area across from the school, they found a tarot card, the death card, which on the back had been written, quote, for you, Mr. Police, code. Call me God. Do not release to the press. Though investigators tried to keep this finding confidential, details were soon being reported nationwide. The day after Iron Brown was wounded in front of his school, a Baltimore police officer pulled Muhammad over for erratic driving, with Malvo in the passenger seat. The man had no warrants or other issues, and the pair were released without incident. 
This was the second time that the snipers were stopped by the police in the Caprice since the beginning of the spree and released without suspicion, likely because the public had by now hyperfixated on finding a white box truck. One day later, on October 9th, just after 8 p.m., 53-year-old project manager and design engineer Dean Harold Myers was gunned down at a Sunoco station in Manassas, Virginia. Two days after that, Philadelphia native Kenneth Bridges, also 53, was killed at an Exxon station in Fredericksburg, Virginia, leaving behind a wife and six children. Investigators cordoned off an enormous area, looking specifically for a white van with a roof-mounted ladder thought to be linked. Four days later, following an after-work errand, FBI analyst Linda Franklin, 47, a terror threat specialist, was killed in the Home Depot parking garage in Seven Corners, Virginia. She was hit while loading up the car with her husband after buying supplies for their new home. Investigators spent the next day following a lead that would take them nowhere after a witness at the scene of Linda Franklin's murder told them they saw a Middle Eastern man in a van with a taillight busted out. This witness turned out to be lying, sending police looking in all the wrong places. A few days later, on October 17th, Malvo used a payphone to call the Montgomery County Police Department and implicate the snipers in the Alabama shootings of Kelly Adams and Claudine Parker. Although police had gotten a good enough look at Malvo to create a composite, nothing came of it. However, his prints were pulled from several items. Also that day, a priest in Ashland, Virginia, received a call from a man who quoted the tarot card and claimed to know who shot middle schooler Iron Brown and FBI analyst Linda Franklin a few days earlier. The caller had also referenced the Alabama liquor store shootings. Five days had passed without a sniper attack in the area until October 19th, when 37-year-old Jeffrey Hopper was hit in the stomach while leaving an Ashland, Virginia, Ponderosa Steakhouse. He survived the attack and bullet fragments extracted from his wounds were used to link his case ballistically to some of the other sniper shootings. Investigators found a letter pinned to a tree that began, quote, For you, Mr. Police, call me God. Do not release to the press. The letter went on to describe how the pair had tried to contact police to begin negotiations, but that whomever they had called were, quote, incompetent and thought the calls were a joke. They request $10 million. The letter ends with, quote, P.S. Your children are not safe anywhere at any time. That priest called police on October 20th, and police were finally in possession of some solid leads. A print had been left near the liquor store shooting that killed Million Walder Merriam in Montgomery, Alabama on the same day as Kelly and Claudine, and that print would later be matched to some of Malvo's fingerprints. They were easily accessible on his forged travel documents, and he was documented to have entered the country with John Allen Muhammad. Malvo and Muhammad's final random target, 35-year-old bus driver Conrad Johnson, was struck and killed three days later, around 6 a.m., as he readied his bus for his route in Aspen Hill, Maryland. He left behind two children. Chief Moose addressed the snipers through the press again, indicating that whatever they'd discussed since the last press conference would not be happening. In the past several days, you have attempted to communicate with us. We have researched the option you stated and found that it is not possible electronically to comply in the manner that you requested. However, we remain open and ready to talk to you about the options you have mentioned. It is important that we do this without anyone else getting hurt. Call us at the same number you used before to obtain the 800 number that you have requested. If you would feel more comfortable, a private post office box or another secure method can be provided. You indicated that this is a... 